Hey guys, today's video is going to be another brainstorming video. Just chatting some things out with y'all as I try to finalize our 2024-2025 curricula and plans for our homeschool. First of all, welcome or welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Kayla. I am a second generation homeschool mom to almost four girls. I have three daughters and baby girl number four is due in just a few weeks. I'm currently homeschooling my fourth grader and my first grader and we are looking ahead to fifth grade and second grade for the 2024-2025 school year. I love to share homeschool resources and curricula reviews on here. Most of the ones that I share are secular or faith neutral. I also just enjoy having nerdy homeschool chats and mama life chats with you guys. So if any of that appeals to you, I hope you'll consider subscribing and sticking around. Okay, so this is actually my second brainstorming video for this school year, for this season as we are planning 2024-2025. So if you haven't yet watched the first brainstorming video, you might want to do so because everything I'm going to talk about today is sort of a continuation and an update on what was mentioned in that first video. I'll go ahead and put it up in the cards and in the description box. I have been going back and forth on what to do for history for a couple of weeks now. After using and loving History Quest for almost three years, I have found it very difficult to decide what to transition to next. And I did all of the things that I would recommend to any of you if you are trying to decide between a few different curriculum options or if you are looking for curriculum suggestions. I watched all the YouTube videos. I reached out to mamas who I am acquainted with via social media who have used any of the programs that I was considering. And in some cases, I found mamas who had actually used more than one or all of the programs I was considering their input was invaluable because they actually could compare and contrast the different attributes of some of these curricula. And I'm talking specifically about Story of the World and Curiosity Chronicles. Those are both secular or for the most part secular um, homeschool curricula for world history, and they are both divided up into four parts chronologically, four or five parts. Um, I think Curiosity Chronicles divides early modern history into two volumes. So I don't know if that really counts as one part or not, but that's neither here nor there. If you are a secular homeschool family and you are looking to study history chronologically on a four-year cycle, so you're doing ancients for a year, you're doing medieval times for a year, you're doing early modern for a year, and then modern history for a year before starting that cycle over. There are really three main programs that I know of that are the most popular for those purposes. So you have History Quest, which we've used and loved. You have Story of the World and you have Curiosity Chronicles. So looking to switch from History Quest, those were the two programs that I was most familiar with and that I assumed we would pick one of those, even though I wasn't completely happy with either option. Obviously, I chose History Quest for a reason. There are definite pros and cons to all of these programs. I actually used one of my daughter's dry erase boards that we use all the time for our homeschool lessons to sort of make a pros and cons list for both of these programs. So I'm just going to share that with you really quickly in case you are also trying to decide between Story of the World and Curiosity Chronicles. So a pro for Story of the World is that the writing style is highly praised. That's something that everyone really agrees on. It is just a really well-written program. It's sort of a living book or narrative style approach, meaning that you have a chapter book as your main spine that's telling you the story of the world, just like the name of the program. There is an audiobook version if that's something that appeals to your family, or you have the option of just reading that 
chapter book allowed. This is a very similar style and setup to how History Quest works. So it's something that I was familiar with. And that's a pro for me. Having it written and designed in a similar style definitely made me feel like it was probably more within our comfort zone to switch to that program. Another pro that I've heard about Story of the World is the variety of activities that are included. History Quest, by comparison, has far fewer activities. Story of the World gives you tons of options, lots of crafts and hands-on activities, and a wide variety of worksheets and activity pages. So if you like having a ton of options, Story of the World will definitely win out over History Quest. Cons that I heard over and over again with Story of the World. A lot of people complain that it is dated, that it is not truly secular, Specifically in the first two volumes, the Ancients and Middle Ages, there seems to be a bias towards a Christian viewpoint. So obviously that is not going to be a great fit for every family, and a lot of people were really bothered by it, especially since it is advertised as a secular program. Another con are the suggested book lists. Now this might be something that has been updated because I know Story of the World was revised in 2020, I believe. So it's possible that some of the mamas I spoke to have used an older version of Story of the World, and maybe this problem has already been fixed. But a common complaint was that the recommended extension reading, so additional literature that you can source to dive a little bit deeper into some of these historical themes, civilizations, people. It was really hard to source these recommended books. They were older books. A lot of them were out of print, almost impossible to find. And I know for sure that would annoy me so much. One of my favorite things about History Quest is the extension literature that they recommend in each unit. I think they do a really great job of not only giving you updated, modern, contemporary literature to look at, but also really fantastic versions, abridged versions, children's versions of classic literature. I also really appreciate that they do a great job of describing each of their literature recommendations to help you narrow down what's worth sourcing for your particular kids. So they'll tell you like, this book is really great for older, more middle school range kids who really want to know more information. Or this book is great for younger kids. Or we're recommending this book, but be careful because it might have some things that are a little bit too violent or a little bit too harsh for some of your more sensitive kids. And I've never had any trouble sourcing any of the books that are recommended by History Quest. In fact, most of them, especially the picture books, I've been able to find on YouTube for free, which is great because that means I don't even have to go to the library and I don't even have to read those books to my kids. We can watch them being read aloud on YouTube for free. We've also had success finding their recommended books at our local library or on thrift books or on Amazon for an affordable price. So yeah, for me, that's been a huge plus of using History Quest and I could see how it would be extremely annoying to have difficulty with the recommended books with Story of the World. The biggest con that I've heard over and over with Story of the World is that it is not as diverse as a lot of people would like it to be in its representation of peoples, cultures, civilizations. A lot of people feel like it's very Eurocentric and so therefore just lacking in information, lacking in inclusivity, in representation. I don't think there's any history curriculum that gets this right or is perfect at it, but a lot of people feel like Story of the World could have made more of an effort. Again, maybe this is something that's been solved with the revision in 2020, but it's something that I jotted down that I wanted to be aware of. Okay, so with Curiosity Chronicles. Curiosity Chronicles is an extremely unique history curriculum. I don't think there's anything else like it on the market. And for some people, that's going to be a pro. For other people, it might be hard to wrap your head around 
how it works because it is so unique. It's written in a dialogue style. So the entire textbook, your entire spine of the curriculum is a conversation between fictional characters. So you have Mona and you have Ted. Those are your main characters. I was specifically looking at the early modern history and in the early modern history volume, they introduce um, two more characters. I think their names are Arthur and Lily. And they are characters that discuss more of the arts related people and themes throughout the program. So you have Ted and Mona, they're conversing back and forth, they're asking each other questions and answering each other's questions and just dropping a lot of knowledge, a lot of facts in their conversation. So you might have a chapter where you're learning about Queen Elizabeth and Ted and Mona are just chatting about everything related to Queen Elizabeth and the dates and, you know, all the historical information is in their conversation. If you're listening to the audiobook version, it almost gave me the feeling of listening to like a podcast. It's two people talking, it's two different voices. And within that conversation, there's just so much information being given to us, the audience. So there's the audiobook version. There's also the option of you just reading it with your kids. I've heard of mamas who assign themselves or their different children different parts, almost like you're in a play. So one child will always read the part for Mona, while the other child will always read the part for Ted or something along those lines. So let's talk pros. Mamas who use and love Curiosity Chronicles love how detailed it is and how inclusive it is and the diverse representation. So it would appear to me that Curiosity Chronicles has the reputation of being the most diverse and inclusive over History Quest and over Story of the World. That's a huge pro. They are definitely written in a more modern style. So they talk about all of the negative downsides of like colonialism. They definitely are not raising any historical figures up on a pedestal. It really seems like they are trying to show a more well-rounded perspective. They're not making anybody into a hero. They're showing the good and the bad of all of these individuals throughout history and really just humanizing them. These are real people. They had flaws. They did terrible things. This is why they did those terrible things. That sort of representation is really important to me. And it's something that I appreciated in History Quest because I think History Quest does a great job of not putting people on pedestals, keeping it real, keeping it honest. So that's definitely something that I was looking for and something that appealed to me. And a lot of people really love that about Curiosity Chronicles. Another pro and unique facet of Curiosity Chronicles is that they focus more on the arts and on human innovation throughout history versus some of the more traditional historical curricula, which might focus on governments, wars, battles, dates, who's in charge, who's taking power from who. Obviously, it's important to know those things. It's important to see how one event leads to another and another and another. That timeline is critical to at least be familiar with, right? I'm not expecting my kids to like memorize all of these dates, but you want to have an overview and be familiar. So Curiosity Chronicles definitely shares all of that pertinent information, but their main focus is on some of the more beautiful things that are happening throughout history. So new inventions, new ideas, philosophy, art, culture, music. And they show that they emphasize that by having an entire section for each chapter that you read that is solely focused on the arts. For example, one of the chapters that we sampled was about Queen Elizabeth. You have this whole information-filled chapter about Queen Elizabeth. And then the secondary arts corner little section at the end of that chapter is all about Shakespeare and the theater and what was going on culturally 
with all of that when Queen Elizabeth was ruling. Okay, so let's talk about cons or potential downsides of Curiosity Chronicles. Story of the World and History Quest are sort of written for a range of grades or ages. I think they're both advertised as being suitable for first through sixth grade. I think. And I would definitely say that that's been true for us with History Quest. Curiosity Chronicles is a little bit different. They are expecting you to go through each of those time periods at a particular grade level or age range. So as you're going through the program, you're going to see a significant jump in the writing complexity, the vocabulary that's used, and also the expectations, the workload, the activities that they have for students. So they have on their website that the ancient volume or ancient history volume is for first to third grade. Then medieval times is for second to fifth grade. And then early modern history is for third to sixth grade. And their modern history volume is for fourth to eighth grade. So each of these volumes are definitely not written to the same level for the same age range of students. That's a big difference between Curiosity Chronicles and the other two programs we've been talking about. A lot of families complained that, you know, they did the Ancients level with Curiosity Chronicles. They loved it. They were excited to keep going with the program. And they just found that the huge level jump in intensity, in workload expectations, in the writing style that their kids were being asked to comprehend was just too much. It was too big of a jump and they were not able to keep up with it. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of these programs based on chatting with so many people who've used them, but also I went in and sampled these programs myself. That is an essential part of looking at curricula options and picking out curricula and resources. For me, I always try to take advantage of free samples. If the publisher or creator of the program offers that. Both Curiosity Chronicles and Story of the World offer free samples. So you can look at text samples of the books and you can listen to audio files to sample the audiobook version. You can also look at sample activity pages, sample schedules, like they really show you a good glimpse of all of the different parts and pieces of these programs. Now, I had already made my pros and cons list. I had already asked all of the questions to several mamas. I actually ended up sharing a lot of responses that I got in my Instagram stories. We had like this really nice discussion going. People were very passionate. There were like hardcore Story of the World fans and hardcore Curiosity Chronicles fans. There was positive feedback about History Quest and negative feedback about History Quest. It really ran the gamut of feedback. And I loved it. I love seeing how passionate mamas are about their homeschool journey. And it's just such a good feeling when you do find that program that feels like a perfect fit for you and your family. Of course, you're going to be passionate about it of course you're going to share all the things you love about it. Or the flip side of that, if you try a program and it really is a fail for your family, you're going to want to share that with everyone that you know too and warn them and say like, wow, this was terrible and this is why it was terrible. So I just had so much fun chatting with so many of y'all and I'm really grateful to Everyone who responded to me, reached out to me, answered my questions, shared their own experiences in using these programs. All of it was super, super helpful. Once I had my samples downloaded and I had my notes, I actually went to my husband. And I don't always do that with um, curriculum choices, but occasionally I do. I do appreciate his input and his opinion. So I actually went up to him in the kitchen and I was like, hey, do you want to pretend that you know what I'm talking about for like five minutes <laughs> and come look at these two history options with me? And he was like, yes, of course. He's so sweet. He completely trusts me and trusts my choices in regards to our homeschool. So he doesn't insert himself or, you know, offer critique or feedback unless it's 
being asked of him, at least most of the time. I mean, sometimes he'll ask a question or have a comment if he notices, you know, something looks like it's gone awry. But for the most part, he's just very supportive. And I know that sometimes his eyes glaze over a bit when I'm trying to talk to him about nerdy homeschool stuff and like different curricula options because it's not his thing and it's not his passion and it's not his job. It's mine. So I get it. But he's always just so sweet when I do go to him and I'm like, I really need to just bounce these ideas off of you. Um, and he's like, yeah. I will totally pretend that I know what you're talking about and we can work this out together and I'll offer my opinion for whatever it's worth. So he looked at all of my notes. He looked at the pros and cons. We listened to some of the samples and looked at some of the samples together. And he was really gung ho about Curiosity Chronicles. He just thought it was the coolest thing and so unique. And he's not wrong. Next were the people that are honestly the most important in this process. And those are my children. I definitely wanted to bring my children in and get their opinion, get their input. Because at the end of the day, if I put all of this research in and all of this time into choosing the perfect history program for us, and they absolutely hate it, I've just wasted tons of time, tons of money, it's just not going to work. In my viewpoint, history is a content subject. So that means we have a lot of freedom in regards to when we learn it, how we learn it, what parts of it we learn. It's not like math or language arts where these are foundational things. You don't have a choice. You have to learn these. With history, we have more give and take and more freedom. And yes, I had started us on the chronological path. I was really hoping to stick with that. But at the end of the day, my goal is for my children to love learning and to be fascinated and interested in learning history so that they will actually continue to do deeper dives in history throughout their entire life, well into adulthood. We are never going to master or complete learning history. There's always going to be new things discovered, new voices being heard that were formerly marginalized or not represented in the narrative. So I just really want my kids to be curious about history and to learn to think like a historian and learn to critically analyze events and people and see how those things from the past affect our present. Those are my goals in teaching history in our homeschool. And I have to make sure that any curriculum or resource that we use is actually helping us to meet that goal. And if they absolutely hate the program that I choose, we are not meeting those goals. So I brought my kids in the room. We played the sample for the audiobooks. We looked at the pages. Right away, my oldest was responding more to Curiosity Chronicles. She really liked the activity pages. She was hesitant at the dialogue style of writing. But after listening to like a good two or three chapters that they include in the sample, she was like, yeah, I actually like this. I like listening to this. I think I could listen to this. On the other hand, both her and I did not like the audiobook version for Story of the World, like at all. And I feel terrible saying that because I think that, you know, they hired someone who they are saying is a highly acclaimed audio narrator person. I don't remember what he's called, but um, I think his name's like Jim Weiss or Jim Weiss. And yeah, I, I'm sure he's very good at what he does. We just weren't feeling it. And the reason why the audiobook versions are so important is because I have a 19 month old. In August, she'll be a little over two when we are starting this new school year and this new level of history, theoretically, I will have a two-year-old and an infant who's like six months old. I really want to be able to rely heavily on the audiobook for our history lessons, just in case I am unable to do all of that reading myself. 
we have a lot of reading across all of our subject areas. I really wanted my kids to love the audio version of whichever program we went with. So Story of the World was not it. The audio book, no, we couldn't do it. It was not our favorite thing. It's very slow. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a man who's reading it. I think maybe we're slightly partial to a female voice and a female narrator. That's what we had for History Quest. I don't know. I don't even know if I could put my finger on exactly what was wrong with it because there's not anything wrong with it. It just wasn't for us. The Curiosity Chronicles audiobook is very fast paced, which is a problem. Uh, almost too fast to keep up with for us. So I actually went and slowed down the playback speed to see if that helped. And it definitely did. And so once we had the playback speed slowed, my oldest daughter was like, yeah, this I'm leaning more towards this one for sure. Her one complaint, which is a valid complaint, is that the characters in Curiosity Chronicles, Ted and Mona, are illustrated throughout the book and they are represented as children, as kids. And the voices on the audio track are very much adult voices. I would say that they don't really fit the way that Ted and Mona look in the illustrations. So that kind of bugged her and it kind of bugged me too, but we were both willing to overlook it. Then my younger daughter, my seven-year-old, came and she was listening to the audio files and following along with the text in the book. And she was like, eh, this is okay. I could tell she was getting kind of overwhelmed with how much information they were saying in such a short time span. I mean, it is very fast paced. And mind you, she is going to be in second grade next year. This level with Curiosity Chronicles for early modern history is meant for third to sixth grade. So the more that we played around with the samples, it just became very apparent to me that this was going to be a big reach for my younger daughter was going into second grade. It felt like it was going to be a little bit over her head and a little bit overwhelming. And that was very concerning to me because so far she has been able to keep up really well with our history studies using History Quest. And I don't want to leave her in the dust. I don't want to make her feel like inferior, like she's not getting it when really the material is just too advanced. So that was a big red flag. Honestly, the more that we looked at and listened to everything in the samples, I was just feeling more and more uneasy. And I could tell the girls were too. My younger daughter was like, can we just wait for the new level of history quest to be released? Like, I really like History Quest. Can't we just stick with that? And so I started feeling like, you know what? Why am I trying to force this square peg into a round hole? I already know what works for us. We have really done well with History Quest. My kids like the style of writing. They like the pace. They're able to both enjoy the units together. We like the recommended extension reading. I like the schedule. I like how simple and streamlined things are that they are not overwhelming me with a ton of activity options. All of the reasons that I chose History Quest to begin with just kept coming back to me and I knew that we weren't going to be completely happy with going with Curiosity Chronicles. We definitely are not going to go with Story of the World. So what now? We have no history curriculum. I guess we're skipping history for the year. This was actually an idea that came up as I was chatting with so many of y'all on Instagram, and I shared a lot of that in my stories. I had several people suggest to me, like, why don't you just take a gap year with history and instead put your focus somewhere else? And there were lots of ideas about where that somewhere else could be. Focusing more on the humanities, doing more art study, doing historical biographies, or focusing more on world geography. And any one of those things could be sort of a culminative review of what we've learned thus far in history and therefore act as a nice bridge year 
before we move into early modern history when and if Pandaya Press releases that history quest level. I'm really hoping that they do by next year. I don't know. Ay, ay, ay. Like that could be a problem, but I don't even want to think about that right now. I just want to figure this year out. So I presented that idea to my kids. I was like, hey, if we're really not feeling another history program, we can just pause and we can dive in with more geography, more art study. You guys can read some biographies. Maybe we'll do some review of what we've covered with medieval history. Maybe we'll sort of ease our way in with the arts, the humanities, biographies into that early modern time period. Right away, both of my kids were like, yes, that's what we want to do. So my next step was, okay, what resources or programs are we going to use for that? And I looked at several options. I got several great recommendations from you guys. Um, layers of learning for art studies that are divvied up by historical time period. And I'll link all of these below so that you guys can check them out for yourself. But that looks really cool. I don't think that Layers of Learning is a purely secular company, but the art study looks like it's secular. It looks like it's relatively inclusive and diverse. So yeah, that looks cool. I had people recommend Beautiful Feet books um, around the world for like geography and map work. I am not at this point in time super eager to try Beautiful Feet books. Beautiful Feet books, if you're not familiar, is a Christian curriculum publisher. They've kind of rooted their teaching style in the Charlotte Mason philosophy, so it's very much literature based. And I know a lot of families who use Beautiful Feet and love it. So I don't want to be negative on that at all. I can just tell by looking at it that it's probably not going to be a great fit for our family. But I did like the idea of doing world geography. So I did like the idea of doing world geography. Another program that came up is the World Geography Junior curriculum from Guest Hollow. Guest Hollow is also not strictly secular. I believe that their founders are Christian, religious, but we already have used some resources from Guest Hollow and I've not seen anything that's overtly religious in anything we've used. Um, on their website, they are pretty clear about like which books might be too religious for a secular family. I always appreciate that extra effort in disclosing you know, information like that. We have had a fantastic experience with Guest Hollow's grammar program, Beowulf's Grammar. My kids love the way it's designed. They love the activities. They love just the whole style of it. So when I was looking at their Geography Junior program, oh, the sun just came out. <laughs> when I was looking at their Geography Junior program, it looks like it's, you know, the same style. It's by the same publishers. So it's written in a similar style. It has similar hands-on activities. It's literature-based, so they recommend a lot of different books for you to be reading throughout the year as you are going through all of these countries and regions. It honestly looks really lovely. I showed it to my kids, and both of them were like, yes, we are so stoked. These are the same people who make Beowulf's Grammar. We are in. We want to do this. So it looks like we are going to be doing Guest Hollow's Geography Junior next year. I'm actually really excited. I feel so relieved now that we've kind of decided on this and settled on it. It just feels like it's the right fit. It feels like it's the right choice for us. Another plus, this geography program is literature based and a lot of the literature are picture books or just really beautifully illustrated books for young readers. My younger daughter has been asking for more picture books and more fun books. So this fits that bill too. Can you tell I'm excited? I'm excited. I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. I just feel so relieved that we all agreed on this decision and path for our next school year. I know that my kids are going to be super invested because they had a voice. They were part of the decision-making process. So yeah. I just feel really good about it. I feel really good about the whole thing. Just to recap, 
we're definitely not using Story of the World. We are definitely not using Curiosity Chronicles, at least not right now. I can totally see us revisiting that program in a few years when my kids are older, maybe when we're on our second cycle with history. We obviously can't use History Quest, even though that would be our preferred option because they don't have the level that we need released. So instead, we are going to do a year where we do a deep dive in world geography we're going to be using Guest Hollow's Geography Junior program as our main curriculum for that. We might be adding in additional resources like the art studies from Layers of Learning. All of the programs that I mentioned today will be linked in the description box so that you can go check them out for yourself. Once I get my hands on Guest Hollow's Geography program, I'll be sharing a flip through with you guys. Once we have time using it under our belt, I'll be sharing a review with you guys like always. This was a huge missing component to finalizing our overall plans for the year. So we're much, much closer to having all of that figured out. And once I do, I will definitely be sharing all of our choices for fifth grade, for second grade, for group family subjects. I'll be sharing all of that in our curriculum choice videos here on the channel in just a few weeks. Before I announce final curriculum choices for next year, I do have a couple of other things on the docket. I have a video series coming out for newbie homeschoolers. If you are brand new and you are wanting to try out homeschooling for the first time, I'm going to be sharing all the how-tos and tips and tricks that I have learned over the years. I'll have a couple of more flip-throughs and more thorough review videos for you guys as well because I know it is curricula shopping season. So stay tuned for all that we have coming very soon. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.